to the Dream Journal. From the studios of KSQD in Santa Cruz, the Dream Journal is a weekly show where we explore the power of nighttime dreams through conversations with dream experts and with you. In the words of Carl Jung, who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awaken. All right, today's music is called Retro National. Retro, oh, sorry, Retro Nanchal. <laughs> like financial. Here in Santa Cruz, we have the delay for tax due. We're all doing our taxes due for October 18th. Thank you very much from the floods last winter. Retro Nanchal. We all know that dreams can galvanize your creativity. Today, we'll meet an author who has published three dream-inspired fantasy novels. Author Donna Glee Williams, PhD, is our guest, and her latest book is called The Night Field. Plus, we'll have music by Lynn Morgan Rosser. I am your host, Catherine Bell of Experiential DreamWork, and welcome to The Dream Journal. We are also a weekly podcast. You can subscribe, rate, and review to get people to help them find the show, but most importantly, tell your friends. We are on a mission to get people talking about dreams, and you can always say, oh, I'm listening to this podcast, The Dream Journal. You can find archives at Apple Podcasts and Spotify, also ksqd.org slash the-dream-journal. Uh, we are only going back till about September on archives right now, unfortunately, because we're having some issues with the KSQD server, but there are uh, a good number of shows available. We are also on PRX, so you can go back till about August on PRX, the public radio exchange. If you subscribe there, look us up. All right. I'm just going to say a few words about my dream uh, this morning that uh, I am on a tight wire doing some acrobatic performance and down below me are children playing. I would much rather be down there with the kids, but somehow I'm up there on the tight wire, smiling, doing my show. And so it's just a reminder for me to get down there with the kids and notice that would be a lot more fun. So let's say hello to to Donna Glee Williams. Hi, Catherine. It's good to be with you today. Great to have you on the air. So this is from Donna Glee. When uh, Donna Glee first met Jeremy Taylor, she was already a writer. But other than her doctoral dissertation, she'd never written in any long form. During her 17 years of dream work with him, she wrote three novels, Seated by Dreams. His fingerprints are particularly high on her latest, The Night Field. You can go to her webpage, DonnaGleeWilliams.com, or look for her book. Again, it's called The Night Field. Her other two books are The Braided Path and Dreamers. So, Donna Glee, uh, novels based on dreams. Uh, say a little bit more about that. Was it the dream that created the whole novel, or was it uh, just the whole the sense of the, the novel? What, what, what got you started? Well, it was even a bit uh, more of a process thing than that. Uh, When I first met Jeremy Taylor, my primary mentor in dream work, um, that was uh, over 20 years ago now. Mm -hmm. And I was at an intensive week-long event he was doing for the uh, University of Creation Spirituality Mm -hmm. that I had been guided to by strong intuitive uh, guidance uh, that was really unusual in my life. And I wound up there at one of his dream classes. And and afterwards, I shyly approached him Mm -hmm. saying, you know, this isn't about one dream. It's about a theme in almost all of my dreams, which is difficulty getting to water. Mm. Would would you be willing to have a conversation with me about that? 
and he was so generous. Uh, he said, absolutely, you know, while I'm teaching here, uh, uh, I'm yours. And he sat down and uh, had a conversation with me about the different forms of difficulty getting to water mm, right. took in, in my dreams. Uh, and um, after we had that conversation, I, I knew I... I knew the path for me was to do more of that kind of um, work. And I asked him, is there any way we could uh, do this uh, at a distance? Because hmm. I live in North Carolina. He was based in California. And, of course, this was pre-pandemic, you know, before we were all so yeah. accustomed to doing things around the planet uh, just at will. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, absolutely. Um, and that started a relationship that went on for 17 years until his death. I, I mean, our, our last phone call, it was more about his situation than mine, uh, was just a few days before he died. Oh, wow. okay. uh, and, uh, and during that process, a, a lot of things happened, but um, the first was my book, The Braided Path, which um, is sort of um, a wonderful and gentle uh, exploration of, I, and, I, and it wasn't consciously this, but it turned out to be exploration of a world in which there was no evil or even human brokenness. Um, what kind of um, lives and, and uh, tensions would be in the lives of people that lived in a system that really worked. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then the second one came from a very specific challenge he gave me. He said, because he had worked with me on many of my, my stories, my poetry, all of that got into the, the dream work with him. Um, and some came from the dream work with him. But he, he said, you know, you've never written anything uh, about your experience of working in a large bureaucracy. Oh, well, yes, I, I hadn't even thought that a fantasy writer might work a, a story out of a uh, large bureaucracy. But my second dream, my second novel, Dreamers, um, was uh, directly an answer to that challenge. And in fact, it also was, it started with writing the scene of um, doing dream work with Jeremy, but sort of translating it out of our world uh, into a fantasy world where a young woman was laying in a sacred space, a chamber dedicated to dreaming, while there was a scribe sitting there ready to take down the dream she brought back. And as I explored that scene, I um, developed the novel Dreamers, mm -hmm. which also unfolded uh, the issues of uh, bureaucracy and power. and. So after having written a book that had no evil, I came to a book where <laughs> there was a bad guy, some moral cowardice, and, uh, and uh, then uh, came the last one, The Night Field, mm -hmm. where I just really began to feel like I must be a writer in total moral decline because it, <laughs> it, it, it's, a, it's a whole evil system mm. uh, that I tackle in that. And, that one was the last one that I had the joy of sharing with him. And his primary gift in that, uh, the overarching gift, was drawing to my attention the fact that it was capturing a moment in human history when humans went from simply receiving the gifts of the Great Mother to actually plowing and planting and essentially forcing the great mother to deliver what we wanted. Uh, and that that was uh, probably a huge psychic trauma for humanity to, to move from one state to the other. 
and my book captures that. It has side by side two cultures, one that lives in sustainable harmony with their environment and one that is more like a contemporary um, force culture based on monoculture, agriculture, and human oppression. Um, so they they have all, I when when Jeremy died, it was like I didn't know how I, I could ever write again. Uh -huh. You know, the dream work had been so entwined with um, my creative life. Mm. And one of the things that he had said to me in the um, in the last few years that we'd been working together, as I was struggling with what my vocation should be. He said several times, you know, you could just hang out your shingle and do what I do. Mm, uh, right. He said, you know, the, the apprenticeship you've had with me, um, which added up to 17 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the apprenticeship you've had with me is more substantial than what we do in the training programs. So at that point, it didn't really speak to my need to be doing that with other folks. But, you know, when the pandemic came and we were all casting around for what gifts can we offer each other while we sit safely in our houses, um, one that came to me was to begin to do um, DreamWorks um, online. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, first one group and then another and then another. And, you know, now it's one of the great joys of my life is to do dream work with other folks many of whom are creatives or become creatives during the process. And, and part of our journey, uh, I, I guess my predominant approach is what is often called projective dream work. Uh, but, you know, I also bring uh, Gestalt and Sonoy in. And Gestalt, is, of, of course, is very interesting to writers because we often will um, use something very much like gestalt head hopping to explore characters or explore situations that we're writing. And Sonoy is very um, on target for creatives because of the question, uh, if you were to make or em enact something this week to honor that dream, what would it be? Mm, okay, well, that so, certainly fits in with the creativity. Yes, yes. yes. So, so that is where we often wind up. And in fact, because I, I am a writer and have been an editor uh, at many stages in my life, uh, another question we add, you know, if this were my dream, what form would it take? You know, would it be a movie script? Would it be a sonnet? Would it be a haiku? You know, uh, just to to play that out. Right. And yeah. the other thing is, of course, the, the thing that I really imbibed from Jeremy Taylor, um, the idea that dreams are sometimes dreamed for others. Oh, yeah. That uh, when uh, people have been doing dream work together for a while, uh, often the gift will be for someone else in the group. So is there a clue there? that How do you know when some, a gift is for another person? Something I've wondered about before. You know, uh, I think that I am clued by energy. Like um, I'm thinking of a time recently when a, a, one of my dreamers told a dream, did the dream work, and I was aware of just um, a, an upboil of energy in someone else. Um, then after we got it tucked in for the per first person, I, then I just turned to the other person and, and worked her inner version of that dream um, just for her, you know. And then uh, there's also an experience I had with another dream worker um, of, of receiving the same thing. 
a fellow dream worker by the name of Jay Joslin had a very powerful dream uh, about Medusa that um, just activated me very profoundly. And um, I uh, asked his permission. Uh, Well, actually, it was more jocular than that. I I was saying, um, Jay, if you don't write this, I'm going to. And he (laughs) he said, go for it. And I did, and I wrote uh, a short story and then realized, oh, my goodness, how do you credit a short story? (laughs) You've written it. Uh Uh, Jay dreamed it. Uh, And, you know, I I submitted it under both of our names, Uh and it's uh, going to be coming out in um, psychological psychological perspectives i think this summer under both of our names yeah. because you know one person dreams one person writes um i think that's teamwork that's a collaboration well that brings me back to the question which is kind of the topic of creativity and dreams and um you mm-hmm. said you have a lot of creatives in your in your groups and uh, what do you uh, um what kinds of things do you do to uh sort of enhance the uh the support that dream has for this level of creativity? Ah, well, um, I, I think that first is to just do the basic respectful exploration of the dream. And, and then the, um, I often phrase this as just a hypothetical because I don't want to lay um, weight and pressure on people. You know, that's not what they come for. Uh, and, and some of my, my folks work in forms that actually take quite a long time to develop uh, the art. You know, some people just sketch or can write very quickly, but I've, I've got uh, textile artists uh, and, you know, other folks that do um, time consuming. Well, certainly uh, a novel uh, is extremely time consuming. <laughs> Yes, yes, but you know when you start writing, you're you're just uh, you, you, it's just you and the page, and and you don't have to worry about dyeing the materials and find you know all of that. So so it's just a hypothetical. If you were going to, uh, what yes. might you do? And and if you were going to create a. Um, a ritual of this, what might that look like? And, uh, and, and just get that hypothetical. And then the other thing I do, and I really um, encourage folks to add this to group dream practices, is that if somebody does make a poem or a story, that there is a place in that group for it to be read and listened to. Because, you know, that is another stage of honoring the dream and its work. Uh, and I, I really don't think it needs to stop uh, when we finish the dream and say, thanks to the dream source. I love that, to bring it back into a later group and uh, share... I have had people bring art into my groups or, or poetry that they've written about uh, a dream. And so I, I think that's a wonderful thing to encourage people to do is to bring it back to the group or whoever they're sharing dreams with as a, a way of honoring that. Another thing we do uh, that uh, kind of, I think, supports the creativity um juice is uh, afterthoughts um, everybody in my group ha- in my groups have each other's emails and um, when dreams um, evoke uh, memories of uh, poems or images or other formats that we can send each other uh, we do we, we we send them and and I you know, I, I'm an over-educated English major, so that often <laughs> comes in the form of uh, poems for me. But other people, you know, have other connections too, and and they are stirred during the dream work, and people whip out literary references and mythological texts and all of that. So it's a, it, it it's a very enjoyable play. Mm, okay. Ah, I, I love that. Um, so I wanted to uh, follow up some of the themes that you've mentioned um, I'm in, the, in the books that you wrote, the novels that you wrote. I had a question about the three novels. Are they all in the same universe? Is it a question of a trilogy? 
No, I don't have a long enough attention span <laughs> okay. to do a trilogy. Uh, no, they're very different worlds. Okay. Um, the um, the night field is set um, in, partly in a rainforest and partly in a uh, dry, um, cr- flat cropland that reminds me of West Texas or Andhra Pradesh, India, and. Uh, the uh, the book Dreamers is set in a place that feels like it owes a debt to uh, my travels in Turkey and Israel and Pakistan. And then um, The Braided Path, although it's definitely mountain, uh, it, it feels almost like a northern European <clears throat> world to me. Although some of my friends have told me quite clearly that they experienced it as sort of uh, indigenous American. Uh, mm. uh, so I guess in some ways I have left that open to the imagination of the uh, people that read. That could be good. Um, but one thing that um, that I've, I understand that's in common is the idea of the hero's journey. And what does that mean uh, for the hero's journey in your, in your novels? And, uh, and, and also the idea of the post-patriarchal world, like, this is like you talked about the tension between the bureaucracy and the uh, the more essential culture. And wonder if you talk a little bit about those two ideas, a hero's journey and post patriarchy. Well, my um, quibbles with the hero's journey really emerged through writing the night field. Mm-hmm. Um, I obviously i'm i'm a fantasy writer you know i have just absolutely venerated the hero's journey since i first read um the hero with a thousand faces way back in my early 20s um and when i went to washington when they brought uh jung's red book for the exhibit uh, in washington yeah um you know they had um an exhibit case devoted to the hero's journey right there. So, so it's something that's been very much part of my life. And yet when I was writing the night field, it kind of hobbled me. (laughs) Uh, And, uh, and as I uh, labored my way through the book, I wasn't consciously thinking about it. But after when I was looking back on it, I realized that uh, the hero's journey is ripe for re-examination because it centers individualism in a world that needs to really decenter individualism. Mm, true. Uh, it uh, our hero's journey as we move into our next stage of even surviving. Yeah is going to have to look at um, how to embrace co-heroes. You know, um, Campbell's articulation of the hero's journey does acknowledge that the hero is probably going to meet some allies and um, helpers along the way, but it kind of trivializes them like some kind of, uh, you know, just temporary crutches or consultants. Yes. It doesn't make them full co-heroes and partners in in the in the journey. Mm, I love that. It also does not embrace the fact that some heroes journeys are not completed in the hero's own lifetime. Um it, there, we need to take into account the idea of multi-generation heroic quests. Like if you think about uh, Martin Luther King Jr., he did not live to see Barack Obama in the White House, but John Lewis did. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, Moses didn't get to lead his people into the promised land. Right, right. But Joshua did. The phrase uh, that comes to mind is uh, pioneers don't get to live in the land. Yes. Don't always yes. get to live in the land. I guess sometimes they do. <laughs> well, and and uh, 
Frodo, you know, doesn't get to live out his life in a healed shire, um, but mm-hmm. Sam does. Yeah. So I think that the next visions of the hero's journey need to kind of uh, make space for co-heroes and also acknowledge that um, even though uh, this hero's journey that has us so deeply imprinted, uh, probably going back to the time of the first hunters and the first gatherers that really did have to go out away from the safety of the group to bring back the good stuff. Uh, that also powered the first stages of colonialism mm-hmm. when, you know, the European guys with the guns, germs, and steel mm-hmm. went out on their quest to get the the spices and the the gold and the silver and the diamonds and the human beings yes, yes. that got swiped from other lands. Uh-huh. You know, Hero's Journey has not always rolled mm. in the direction of justice. Good point. And I think it's time that we start exploring, if we love it, exploring for how it needs to be brought up to date. Uh, Campbell articulated that 70 years ago. And, um, and we are still putting our stories and our popular culture products through that filter. Absolutely. And, and another issue about it is it ignores the fact that if somebody starts off on a hero's journey, someone also stays home. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to look at the hero staying as well. Uh, um, the communities, the whole level of community mm-hmm. support. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you. What, yeah, yeah, go what, ahead. One more well, I, I wanted to say it also puts filters on our eyes. I mean, um, when you think about the epic, what we call the epic of Gilgamesh, I guess this is going back to the point of co-heroes. The epic of Gilgamesh is not the epic of one man. We, we have laid that title on it. But if you look at the story itself, it's the story of co-heroes right. doing their thing. But if we keep putting that individualism um, filter on things, that's all we see. Okay. Well, I love that. This is a, a really revolutionary idea. I think it's a wonderful uh, thing to really question about our our understanding of, uh, of what's meaningful in life. And so our guest today is Donna Glee Williams. Her new book is called The Night Field, and we're talking about dreams and creativity and really the remaking of society or the uh, unmaking or bringing it back to something uh, more sustainable. So we are going to ha- come back real soon, and we're going to talk uh, about um, uh, using fantasy to address real-world issues and also, we're going to have a, a, a guest caller, uh, Lynn Rosser, who is a musician who created some music for the book, and she will. Uh, we have some music to play uh, for her, and so we will get to that as soon as we are done with our break. So we are broadcast live from the KSQD studios in Santa Cruz and co-broadcast live in San Jose by KCXU. Okay, this is the Dream Journal. My name is Catherine Bell, and uh, our guest today is Donna Glee Williams, and she's talking about her new fantasy novel. We have John from Santa Cruz on line two. Hey, John, thanks for calling. I'm, I'm here. Um, relative to the way that we dream, there's a person, his name is Dan Levitan, and he wrote a book that said, uh, that encompassed your brain on music. And they did functional MIs on two people, one person who played music, the other person had nothing to do with music. They asked them same, the same questions, and the way that the person that played music they access different portions of their brain as opposed to the ones who didn't play music. Oh. Kinesthetic, uh, feeling, all that. So um, 
I wonder how that uh, how that influences how we dream too, because it's going to, I think, go the same pathways. But uh, music is such an important part of uh, our life experience. Absolutely, John. That's so that's a wonderful observation. I have not uh, read that study and. I've uh, been interested in music and it comes and goes in various times in my life. And uh, I'm actually in a phase of the last year or two of learning to play the ukulele and writing songs. And uh, interesting to think that I'm using different parts of my brain now. I could totally, I could totally see that. Yeah, and, and even um, I, I wish if I could fund it in high schools, uh, you would have to take a language freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior year. Uh, hopefully four different languages and music could be one of those languages because it is a language hmm. um and that would because they you know they say they're romantic languages or um, it, you know who mila kunis is she was on a phone conversation with her dad one time and when she hung up her friend said are you mad at your dad she goes oh no i was telling him i love him it's because of the different nature of the Russian language as oh. opposed to French or Spanish or whatever. I think learning multiple languages would enable us to understand others' differences. Interesting. And I think that would be beneficial. Wow. I love that proposal, John. I think that's fabulous. Uh, uh, Donna Glee, do you uh, have any comments about that? I know music's important to you. I, I do. I, um, I think that that idea of letting music be one of the required languages is also brilliant in terms of uh, justice, because uh, requiring uh, languages, uh, I mean, it's, it's wonderful, and it completely favors the um, linear, logical, verbal uh, uh, gifts of some people. But music would be uh, an area that many people who can't do the verbal, rational stuff um, uh, in, in easily can access music, and not just easily, but can thrive there. And I think that that would be a, a, a form of educational justice and would love to see that happen. Uh, so thank you for putting that idea onto the world, and I hope someone hears it. Great. Uh, one one last thought. Sure. You remember that, that uh, show? It was called Name That Tune. Oh, yes. I can name that how, tune in how, four notes. How, <laughs> yeah, how do we know, name that tune with one note? <laughs> how do we do that? <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's uh, incredible! All right, well, thanks. Thanks. Okay, well, a comment from uh, Rick here: Music is a high bandwidth form of transmitting nonverbal info. I I agree with that. Thank you. This is my engineer, Rick Leffel. Um, absolutely. So I think we have Lynn back on the other uh, line. So let's switch over to uh, this is Lynn Rosser from Asheville, North Carolina, and she created some music for the book. And so, hi, Lynn. Hi! Great nice to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank thank you for calling in. And I uh, want maybe you guys. I'm not sure who wants to go first. Uh, what do you mean, music for a novel? Is this uh, how how does this come about? And then we have a clip. We like to play some some clip from some of the music that Lynn has written. Sure, Lynn, music would you... from a novel. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, and just to, to to pick up the tail end of what was just said, one other element of education in music is that. Um, when you learn music, you activate multiple regions of the brain at the same time, and you coordinate them. So requiring music is actually a wonderful idea to be able to enhance everyone's sort of general uh, brain interconnectivity and power. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw those two cents in. But I know, it's pretty beautiful uh, the way John uh, just slipped right in there and, uh, and picked yeah. up on some of these themes. Great. So in terms of the novel... Um, I was deeply inspired by Donna Glee's work and have known her for a long time. Uh, we're sort of creative companions, you know, friendships over a long time, and, and I saw the novel develop. And uh, I was kind of coming out of a place where I needed to um, begin doing some creative work again and was ready to do some. And I just kind of asked her, hey, would it be okay if I took my deep inspiration uh, that I have from from your characters, and 
uh, your story and and tried putting some songs to them. Hmm. So that was kind of how it was born. We sort of talked about what that might look like, and I wanted to make sure that, you know, I, I kind of had permission to do that. Right. First. Right. Um, and to, you know, to honor the work and what seems, you know, would be important to her. And um, so it was kind of in terms of, of that was a, a collaborative uh a uh, thought process on it, and then I sort of took it and ran with it, and in, in my own direction. And um, my my brilliant husband uh, produced the the songs for me, um, uh, you know, collaboratively also with my ideas and all of that thing. You know, those things uh, at Hall Reed Art Studio here in Asheville, North Carolina. Oh, so, nice. and yeah, that's how it was born. Wonderful, Donna Clay. Do you want to add anything to that, or should we go to the music? Well, I, I do want to add that this almost seemed like a super, um, I was going to say supernatural, but even maybe transpersonal is, is more the word I'm looking for, as mm. if um, this uh, story exists in um, some other kind of imaginal space, and um, as if Lynn has access to the story there as a musician in the same way that I might have access to it as a writer. Because even though Lynn had read early, early drafts of this book, because I often go to her for support and um, good questions and conversation, uh, when she started uh, letting this music flow out of her, she really had not seen the book for years hmm. and didn't even need to see the book. Hmm. Uh, it was like it was there. And at first I was like, oh, Lynn, don't you want to read the, the current version? And, <laughs> right. and then I thought, no, don't mess with this. You know, <laughs> like whatever she's, she's on to, that's the, that's the true dharma there. Let, uh, let it go. So, so this is what came. And, and, uh, and it was uh, an amazing collaboration uh, with, between her and the story and uh um, her husband, Chris Rosser, and her son uh, also contributed to the post-production work. So take a listen. It's okay. pretty amazing. One by one we make our way, getting closer every day. Back to the real. Some bridges take a generation to spend the distance of our minds like Hey, beautiful, beautiful song. Let's leave it maybe playing just a little bit in the background. And uh, so, yeah, that's just gorgeous. So, uh, Lynn, how did you, uh, how did this music come to you? Do you uh, have anything you want, else you want to say about how you hear that song? It's such a beautiful, catchy song. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Well, um, for me, a lot of times things start from an emotional place. Yeah. And that taps into sort of that intuitive kind of realm. And as Donna Glee was saying, you know, this story lives for me in the imaginal realm. Um, and it has for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And her characters, you know, they're, they're very much uh, accessible <laughs> to mm -hmm. um, in, in that sense. And to me, that's kind of almost a, a, akin to where, uh, to, to the dreamscape in some ways, there's that, that imaginal realm is very similar, in other words. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I love tapping into that and to feel that and to imagine it and to bring uh, myself into the environment of her story um, and from there try to work with the themes that she and I talked about um, of, you know, the first song is listening to trees, about getting that feeling of expanding out from the small self out into the larger world um, through meditation, which is really what that is about, and touching what's called the flow, which is sort of the chi of this world, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the energy of this world and expanding out that way. Um, so d just things like that that, that 
are meaningful to me both as a you know on a personal level but also related directly to the story it, it was a real joy to be able to connect that and to have this connection with Donna Glee as well excellent so. and what about your dream world do you also uh, pay attention to your dreams Lynn is that something that uh, oh, interests yes. you okay uh, <laughs> I uh. do pay attention to my dreams I, I um, throughout my life I've been uh, inspired and sometimes warned um, mm-hmm. uh, by things in my dreams um, and just uh, that is something that that I've always paid attention to um, mm. kind of I've had a few sort of uh, dreams that told me something was coming kind of thing. And, oh, yeah, yeah. and uh, it was different than this particular circumstance, but, you know, whether an illness or something like that. So I definitely pay attention when, when my dreams come and they, they tap me on the shoulder, I definitely listen. Right, right. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lynn, so much. And uh, Donna Glee, is there anything else you have for Lynn you want to share with Lynn here? Uh, just undying appreciation, oh. and I guess I would also <laughs> say, um, uh, just in terms of folks who might uh, be shy about playing in each other's sandbox, <laughs> that it, it is incredibly rewarding if you find someone, um, I, I mentioned already the collaboration of uh, me and a fellow dream worker, Jay Jocelyn, uh, and now you're hearing about a collaboration with me and another mm-hmm. uh, on, the, on the music, that if you can find people that um, will share the play with you, it, it keeps you rolling. You know, um, I am by nature... I, I guess I, I call it lazy, uh, but but there there is something about having others there with you that can stimulate uh, and and um, can um, can really keep you rolling and support you. And just the other day, you know, uh, Lynn gave me a talking to about you know we've got to hear. We have to hear Maroc's story. You know, I've written mm. Pinpoy's story in the uh, night field, but we have to hear Maroc. And, and I really heard her say that, and I don't know what will come. You know, mm. that's that's always, <laughs> um, you just don't know what what you will be offered from the from the realm of, uh, of story and dream. But uh, that kind of uh, lifting up and stimulating, and also uh, we are often, um, y- you know, accountability buddies with mm. getting the work done. Yep. Um, it, it is definitely one of the things that we can offer each other in the creative life. Oh, fantastic. So, so Lynn, do you have any um, uh, web page where people can go to find this music, or is there a way that this music will be? released or yes, people can get in touch with you yeah, there's there's a couple ways um one is i do have a website um and it's lynnmorganrosser.com that's one thing together l-y-n-n-m-o-r-g-a-n-r-o-s-s-e-r.com um and this music is also available for streaming on all streaming platforms you can find a uh, songs for the night field um, by Lynn Morgan Rosser on Spotify and iTunes and Amazon, all of those places. So I'm out there, and I'd love to also hear from you if if you want to share anything with me. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, and, Lynn. And Catherine, I'd yeah. like to say yes. that um, uh, the the way that we are supporting musicians in our world now is very fluid. It's changing, like in in the past. If you wanted to support a musician, you would just go buy their CD or something like you buy my book if you want to support my work. Well, to support Lynn's work, you go to uh, Coffee. Um, it, it's K-O-F-I, right, Lynn? Yes. Okay. Uh, you can find Lynn Morgan Rosser at Kofi.com and, and buy me a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful. That, Thank you support. That, uh-huh. That is how we are supporting our musicians now. And, and you know, Lord knows they need it. That's They're human it. beings, too. Absolutely. They, they have families. They do. Thank you. Oh, that wonderful how you guys support each other. All right. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks for calling. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right. Mm. Okay. Bye now. Bye. 
So I wanted to, Donna Glee, I wanted to, uh, well, let me mention your webpage too. We'll, we'll mention it again, DonnaGleeWilliams.com. Um, yes. And uh, I also wanted to just get to this particular topic with, to touch on in the last few minutes here of using the fantasy to address real world issues. And, you know, this is something that I really love about fantasy and science fiction. And it's a whole nother conversation about the distinction between fantasy and sci-fi. But in any case, to use these uh, imaginal uh, realms to uh, comment on real life issues. I wonder, I wonder if you want to say a little bit about that. Well, I can say some about my experiences yes. with that. Perfect. And and one is that I have been involved uh, for decades now with a project called the Eco Tipping Points Project. Uh, and you can find that online. That is a um, um, a project that is collecting um, real world ecological restoration success stories and analyzing them to understand the patterns of what makes for success in uh, in healing environmental wounds. Mm. Um, that is real science that has to do with real waking world issues. Mm. Uh, and as part of that, I got involved with a, um, a project in India where some extremely poor uh, farmers uh, had gotten essentially addicted to the use of pesticides, to where they could not farm without the use of, of heavy pesticide inputs. And then they, like other addicts can, kicked the habit and became pesticide free. And uh, they transformed their, their health, their economic situation. I mean, they're, they're still poor, but they are not in um, enchained uh, slavery uh, based on uh, their economic situation and they're, uh, they're not needing to put their children into indentured labor anymore and things mm. like that. Uh, and uh, this has a lot to do with the principles of eco-tipping points, uh, the way they were able to do that. And those principles are uh, deeply, deeply infused throughout my book, The Night Field. Mm -hmm. uh, so deeply infused that, in fact, um, the, um, the theoretician that created uh, the eco-tipping points theory, um, whose name is Dr. Gerald Martin, uh, wrote um, a set of questions uh, for discussion that are on my website, hmm. DonnaGleeWilliams.com, for readers of, of the night field that want to understand the, the real science uh, behind this fantasy. Hmm. So um, it is my hope that people who, who come for the story stay for the science. Right. <laughs> and, um, and the other hope that I have is that uh, many of us um, are triggered to resistance by certain things uh, or are triggered to um, a sense of paralysis by certain things. And when I write a book about pesticides without ever once using the word pesticide, I hope that I can trigger thinking that goes beyond any resistance or paralysis. Mm, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. You, you know? Very important uh, stuff, yeah. Just, just raising questions without uh, hitting the knee-jerk reactions that certain terminology right. can uh, put on the table, I think is valuable. And then finally, there is the fact that the pain caused by oppressive, oppressive agriculture is in the real world huge. And that is not a story that I could fully accurately tell uh, from my own personal experience. Uh, and I, I couldn't tell it at all without years of serious research. Mm. And when I situate some of those issues in a fantasy world, 
I hope that I can raise those questions without treading on other people's story that are theirs to tell. All right. Oh, that's beautiful. I'm wondering, do you have a short passage that you'd like to read just uh, to kind of send our listeners off? You know, I will read them the opening, the very opening of the night field, and you can let it trail off into nothingness if you run out of time. (laughs) Okay, perfect. Thank you. (laughs) Twin posts straddle the broad path. A lintel beam hangs between them, marked with odd faded symbols that give off the chilly feel of power. A ghost door? Some kind of gateway? Not a gateway. Nothing behind the post, nothing on either side. No walls, no fence, nothing for a gate to enter or exit. Nothing but more empty land, flatter than any natural thing. The bootmen hustle me through between the posts and right then the light fades from the sky. Is it only that we have crossed over just as the sun went down? I do not think so. There is something dark here darker than simple night. Well, let's leave it there. Thank you so much, Donna Glee Williams. This is a real pleasure to talk to you. Good luck on your next novel. I appreciate you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much for listening. The Dream Journal is produced at the studios of KSQD in Santa Cruz, and we are live every Saturday at 10 a.m. Pacific at ksqd.org, in case you want to call in. Podcast is released on the Monday after the show keeps us growing when you subscribe, rate, and review. I am Katherine Bell. You can find out about my dream coaching practice at experientialdreamwork.com. You can email me at katherine at ksqd.org, k-a-t-h-e-r-i-n-e at ksqd.org, and can follow Experiential Dreamwork and uh, hashtag The Dream Journal on Facebook and Instagram to find out about upcoming shows. I'd like to thank Rick uh, Kleffel, uh, Tony Rosimano, Uh, The intro music is Water Over Stones. Outro is Everything, both by Mood Science. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, take a minute to write down your dream and bring it to the next dream journal.